The latest developments into the January 6th investigation with the clock ticking is where we start this hour with one of the committee members, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren of California. I, I will just say my personal opinion is that midterm history can be defied. I worked for a president in an unprecedented moment of, of angst for homeland security issues specifically in 2002, and that history was defied. But how much does, regardless of the midterm result, how much does the, the clock weigh on your work? We need to get an answer to this. I mean, we had um, a situation where the government itself came close to being overturned uh, on January 6th. And we need answers. We need uh, to make our best recommendations to keep that from happening again. And there's a lot of information that we are have already obtained. I mean, more than 30,000 documents over 275 witnesses and more coming in. Um, but there's a lot to go through and we're committed. And by the way, you know, it's a committee of Democrats and Republicans, but we're all pulling in the same direction here. It's not the way you see a lot of congressional committees where people are throwing bricks across the aisle, no. We are pulling together to get all the facts. And and you, you, it's not clear always from the outside, but, but it's clear that the mission of the investigation and the urgency to do what you just described is that unifying force. I, I want to focus on something you just said, because I feel like from the outside, we focus so much on those witnesses who refused to come in, the Steve Bannons and the Mark Meadows, and we'll get to Meadows in a second. But 275 witnesses, I mean, you, you guys haven't subpoenaed people who don't know anything. You've subpoenaed the people who are closest to the ex-president the people who ran his campaign, and the people who gathered the insurrectionists in Washington. Mark Short is a perfect example. I, we, we looked up and we remember that he was, Trump was so mad at him, he was banned from the White House the day after the insurrection. I, I know you can't talk about the evidence they're providing, but, but can you characterize the helpfulness level and the scale of, of sort of 1 to 10 of the witnesses, the 275 who have come in? Let me just say that uh, a significant amount of very telling evidence has been accumulated. Uh, there's more that we're doing, uh, but it is a significant case that has is developing, and the staff is working overtime, uh, pulling all the pieces together and connecting the dots. Now, all, all these witnesses are important, but no single witness has all of the information. So, I mean, just think about a text message. I mean, you send a text message, you have it because you sent it, but the recipient also has it. Uh, so, you know, we're pulling things together. And I guess what you're saying without saying it is you don't need 100% of the witnesses, that you've got enough cooperation that whether Meadows and Bannon decides not to come in, you may have things on the other end of their communications? No, you know, Mark Meadows sent over uh, thousands of uh, documents. Some were documenting his real-time communication as January 6th unfolded. Uh, he didn't assert some privilege about that. He sent it over to us. We'd like to ask him questions about it, and it's ridiculous that he is now having sent it to us, refusing to answer questions about it. And by the way, he's just published his book. Uh, you know, apparently I haven't read it yet, but from the reports, uh, he relates conversations that he had with former President Trump. He could do that for money, but he can't come in and tell the committee what he said. That's just untenable. So yes, we do need to hear from him. Um, but he is not the only source of information. Will the committee refer him to the House for criminal contempt? Well, we're going to go ahead with this deposition tomorrow. Uh, I hope that he's getting good advice because I'll tell him right now, his position is not supported by the law or the statutes. He needs to come in. Uh, if, he, if he defies the law, then I don't think we have a lot of choice but to refer this to the House, to refer to the uh, Department of Justice. The committee... You know, I'd like to say something oh, so Go ahead, else. please, please. I, I, I was listening to your prior um, segment on, you know, the anniversary of Pearl Harbor, and it reminded me the day after Pearl Harbor, my dad, my late dad, went down to volunteer, to fight for the country. And it was a traumatic event for the United States. But FDR 
said, we have to take a critical look and investigate what happened on, on the failures uh, at Pearl Harbor because it was important for the country. We did the same thing after 9-11. What is wrong with these people who were in government that they don't want to uncover what happened on January 6th? Where is their patriotism? What are they trying to hide? Well, after, I guess I, I would ask you, after interviewing 275 witnesses, what, what are the possibilities other than protecting Donald Trump? Well, you know, one does suspect that because in the case of Many of these witnesses, uh, their defiance of the law is uh, is pretty astounding. It's just, it's not right, and it's not in keeping with our history as a patriotic country, uh, and especially on this anniversary of Pearl Harbor. We ought to recall how lucky we are to be Americans and the history that came before us and not let our country down in this way. I wonder if I could just ask for, for your reflections. I mean, you've, you've put the investigation in this historical framework of, of one of these things is different. Our response to Pearl Harbor, um, a horrific and tragic attack on our country. Our response to 9-11, a horrific and tragic um, attack on our country. The attack on the Capitol, thank God the loss of life didn't rival either of those two tragedies, but it was an attack on the seat of government and its intent was to overthrow the will of the voters. What, it, what is your sense of why patriotism doesn't trump tribalism in uncovering how that happened? Well, for a lot of people, it does. I mean, it would be, I guess, I don't want to have too broad a brush because we've had tremendous cooperation from a lot of people. But it is distressing. I mean, the mob came alarmingly close to overturning the election and uh, turning it over to uh, a person who didn't win the vote, who, who was not elected. That's pretty serious. That's really, um, in some ways, um, um, as, um, as a constitutional matter, a, a more of more import than just attack from a foreign enemy. Mm -hmm. um, we need to make sure that that never happens again. And I'm grateful to the many, many witnesses that are stepping forward out of a sense of duty and love of their country to tell the truth. And it's very disappointing when some individuals who should come in and tell what they know refuse to do so, throwing forth, you know, bogus excuses. I, you've been so generous with your time. I have one more question. Um, we've spent a lot of time the last two days delving into this very well reported out cover story in The Atlantic by journalist Bart Gelman about the next coup. And I, I know that that, that, that um, Chairman Thompson and, and Liz, Congresswoman Cheney have made comments about the mission being as, as much investigating what happened, but also preventing a future coup. How, right. how much does that reporting, and I don't know if you've read the piece or not, but how much does the future threat and the continued sort of metastasization of the big lie, how much does that weigh on all of you and, and drive the investigation? What's very concerning that a significant portion of the population was lied to and believed the lie. Um, and, you know, some of the people who attacked the Capitol thought they were doing the right thing, that they were saving the country when, in fact, they were trying to overturn the government. What we want is a system that really is envisioned in our Constitution, where we, the people, choose our government. The Constitution guarantees to each state a Republican form of government, enshrines the right to vote in the Constitution. So it's the voters who need to be protected, and they decide, uh, not a partisan vote counting who doesn't count the votes, uh, not a legislature who thinks that they can overturn uh, the voters' decision. We need to really tighten up uh, the legal system so that you can't abuse the American voters. And, you know, we don't have all that legislation drafted yet, uh, but it, the information we're getting is very helpful and informative as we think about what to propose. And the final report, the final investigation, will include proposed legislative fixes to help prevent some of what we saw on January 6th in and around that date. I'm, I'm sure it will. Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, who has um, a ton of things on her plate, thank you very much for starting us off this hour on all the day's headlines.